Well, a subset of males are are biologically hyper aggressive. You yes. can identify them at two years of age. And they're the kids. If you put a bunch of two-year-olds together, there's a small subset. They're almost all males, about 5% of males, who will kick, hit, bite, and steal. Okay, so that's their biological programming, let's say. But the vast majority of them are socialized by the time they're four years old. So That's you have me. These, yeah, sure, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the thing about, about boys like that is that if you socialize them properly, it's quite a bit of work because they're very combative. My son was like that. And if you socialize them properly, then they can become r- unbelievably useful. They're courageous. They're forthright. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to back down from a challenge. There's all sorts of massive utility in that. And that's this proper interplay between the biological circuitry and the socialization. But, you know, and, and with, with James Damore's memo, you know, he, he was, he, he's been accused of taking a biological essentialist yeah. route, which is not true. One of the things James said is, look, there's credible evidence that there are biologically mediated differences between men and women at the level of temperament and interest that are actually large and profound. And I would say the science on that is sufficiently settled so that someone can come out and say that's scientifically credible. Now that doesn't mean it's right because the scientists could be wrong. But what you can't say is that what James Damore said was scientifically uninformed. It was scientifically informed. But he also said, look, let's make the assumption I'm paraphrasing slightly, but let's make the assumption that we want to, as a society, we want to extract maximum useful economic value from talented people. So one of the things we want to do is if some of those people are women and some of them are men, we want to understand the actual differences between women and men so that we can set up the workplace so that both women and men can contribute to the maximum economically so that they can benefit as individuals and everybody can benefit socially. So you can use the biological... So, I mean... For example, one of the things, here's, here's a biological problem. On average, women are more agreeable than men. And I think that's because agreeable people are, they're self-sacrificing. And I think as a woman, you need to be wired to be self-sacrificing or you won't be able to tolerate taking care of infants. That's my sense of it. Okay, now there's some problems with that. It's like, let's say that a huge part of female wiring is, is tilted in the direction of the necessity of self-sacrifice for infant care. Okay, that doesn't equip women very well for dealing with, with aggressive men because aggressive men and infants are not the same creatures. So women p- play a, pay a price, be, being optimized to some degree for infant care, they pay a price that they're less, uh, what would you call, prepared, that's one way of thinking about it, in de- with dealing with hyper-aggressive and competitive men. Well, one of the consequences of that is that agreeable people don't make as much money and the reason for that is to make money, you actually have to be disagreeable because you have to go to your boss and say, give me some bloody money or something you don't like will happen to you. You have to, like, uh, also, I'll leave. You have to be able to fight for an idea, too. <laughs> yeah. But so there's something that this is a perfect test case. So biologically speaking, there's a very good reason for certain kinds of wisdom to be biased in the direction of manifesting uh, in females. Females, because they have the capacity to have fewer offspring in a lifetime than males uh, are uh, obligated, as you say, to to care in a particular way. And the fact that care in human beings takes so many years has resulted in menopause emerging. And menopause, essentially, when a woman is done producing new offspring, her interests in uh, her evolutionary interests, which in this case I think are honorable, become synonymous with the lineage, the population, because her offspring will either do well or do poorly based on the population that they're in. So women have a kind of farsightedness about lineage. And I, I don't think this has anything to do with human women, actually. This is a trait that we can see uh, in females uh, of other species. So it's an ancient thing. Whereas males are high variants. That is to say, uh, a male can have many offspring in a lifetime. Many males have no offspring in a lifetime. And that high variance means that to the extent...
extent that there's wisdom that surrounds risk-taking, that has traveled historically uh, along the male path. Now, in modern times, there's no reason that we can't look at these two kinds of wisdom and democratize them both, right? The fact is there's no reason if you're born female that you can't tune into what has historically been uh, male-biased wisdom and take advantage of that, and we should be encouraging this. There's no reason that people have to continue... But the problem is, is that we can't actually have a, a reasonable discussion about it because, you know, the discussion is often forestalled by the claim that, well, men and women are exactly the same. It's like it's, that's not a helpful discussion. And, you know, with the agreeableness issue, I don't know exactly what should be done about that, but one of the consequences of it is is that there's many reasons why, why the pay, there's pay differential between men and women, and the issue itself is very complex. But we do know that agreeable people overall make less money in the same positions, and it's because they don't negotiate on their own behalf very well. Now, it's conceivable that you could have an intelligent public policy or corporate policy discussion about what to do about that. Like, maybe, maybe the rule is something like, um, you review male salaries once a year and female salaries every eight months or something like that, you know, and I'm not saying that's a good idea. not saying that i'm saying that if you if you take the facts on the ground into account there are ways that you might be able to use them so that you could and i'm not going to say level the playing field because i think that's an appalling phrase but maximize the possibility of economic contribution across the genders which is obviously in everyone's best interest